the language of quantum mechanics is linear algebra. So this is where we're forced to start. Linear algebra is the study of linear transformations and the entities they act on, vectors. Vectors are abstract mathematical objects, only slightly less fundamental than numbers. If you see these angle brackets and something inside, that denotes a vector. Vectors can be added and their addition is associative and commutative. They can also be multiplied by numbers and this multiplication is distributive. If you've previously encountered vectors and thought about them as having both magnitude and direction, you should forget what you think you know. Those are Euclidean vectors in their subset of their more abstract siblings that quantum mechanics deals with, which are best defined by axioms that describe how they behave under addition and multiplication by a number. It's common to scale vectors by numbers and then add them together. So this gets a name, linear combination. If we have a group of vectors and some vector in the group can be expressed as a linear combination of the other vectors in the group, the group is linearly dependent. Linear independence is the opposite. The plane helps illustrate these concepts. It's defined as all the vectors that can be expressed as a linear combination of the vectors x and y. So any three vectors in the plane are guaranteed to be linearly dependent. The span of a set of vectors is all the vectors that can be expressed as a linear combination of the ones in the set. Span can also be used as a verb. A basis is a set of vectors that both span a space and are linearly independent. So it's a minimal set of vectors that span a space. The span of a set of vectors is a vector space because any vector in the span can be added to any other vector in the span to give another vector in the span and all the vector space axioms hold. So the concept of span gives us a way to define vector spaces. If a vector space has a basis consisting of n vectors, then any set of more than n vectors is going to be linearly dependent, and hence can't be a basis. This implies that all bases have the same number of vectors. This unique number is called the dimension of the space. A linear transformation turns one vector into another. Linear transformations are denoted by capital letters with hats. They're called linear because when they act on a linear combination, it's as if they acted on each piece of that linear combination individually. Because of this, they can be defined by how they transform the basis vectors of a space. Any vector in a vector space can be expressed as a linear combination of some basis vectors of the space. A common shorthand for writing this linear combination is to put the coefficients of the basis vectors in a column called a column vector. Similarly, linear transformations can be concisely represented by taking the column vectors that correspond to the vectors that some basis vectors are transformed into and lining them up side by side in a matrix. Applying a linear transformation to a vector maps to multiplying a column vector by a matrix, and that's where the weird rules for carrying out this multiplication come from. The inner product is an operation that takes two vectors and produces a number. It satisfies several axioms. A vector is normalized if its inner product with itself is 1, two vectors are orthogonal if their inner product is 0, and normalized orthogonal vectors are orthonormal. The inner product allows us to define an operator that acts on a vector to produce a number. We can extend this operator to a linear transformation by taking the number produced and using it as a scalar for the left vector in the inner product. This is called a projection operator. Classical mechanics models physical systems as masses with positions. All other properties of the system are derived from these. The velocity, acceleration, momentum, energy. We usually assume the mass doesn't change, so the game is to find the position for all times given the forces acting on the system. And we do this using Newton's second law, which relates these two quantities. Quantum mechanics is fundamentally different. It models physical systems as normalized vectors in an n-dimensional inner product space over the complex numbers, where n is the number of distinguishable states of the system. All other properties of the system are derivable from this state vector. The evolution of the state vector is driven by the Hamiltonian, a sibling of the force vector. The Schrodinger equation relates the state vector and the Hamiltonian like Newton's second law does the position and the force. We solve it to find the state vector for all times. A qubit is a quantum system with two distinguishable states, so we model it as a normalized vector in a two-dimensional inner product space over the complex numbers. The vectors 0 and 1 are the computational basis states, and the state of the qubit, psi, is usually expressed as a linear combination of them. When you make a measurement on a qubit, you won't find it to be in a linear combination of the two computational basis states. 
it has to pick one because the result of your measurement isn't going to be a linear combination. Either the electron went through the top slit or it went through the bottom slit. We call this choosing collapse and say the state vector collapses to the state zero or the state one upon measurement. Note that prior to measurement, the qubit can exist in superposition, that is in a linear combination of the two basis states. This is bizarre because prior to measurement, the qubit evolves according to the Schrodinger equation. But at the moment of this mysterious action, the state of the qubit instantaneously changes to one of the basis states. This is at the heart of most philosophical discussions about quantum mechanics and why different interpretations of quantum mechanics exist. Why does an observer play a special role? What qualifies as an observer, as measurement? Isn't an observer also a quantum system evolving according to the Schrodinger equation? When the state vector collapses, it doesn't do so arbitrarily. It collapses to the state zero with probability equal to the squared magnitude of the complex number scaling the state zero. And it collapses to the state one with probability equal to the squared magnitude of the complex number scaling the state one. This is why the state vector has to be normalized. The probabilities have to sum to one because upon measurement, the qubit will collapse to some state. The famous Heisenberg uncertainty principle is a consequence of wave function collapse and the fact that different measurements are associated with collapse to different bases. And the basis states for one measurement may be superpositions of the basis states for another. For example, a position measurement has a different basis associated with it than a momentum measurement. So having a definitive position, that is being in one of the classical position states, guarantees an undefined momentum because the classical position states are superpositions of the classical momentum states. So making a measurement of a particle's position collapses its state vector to a classical position state, which is a superposition of classical momentum states. Hence the popular phrase that a particle cannot simultaneously have both a well-defined position and momentum. As interesting as single qubit systems are, a quantum computer comprised of a single qubit is not very powerful. So we need to learn how to treat multi-qubit systems. A system with two qubits has four distinguishable states, so its state vector lives in a four-dimensional space. The basis vectors of the space can be given as binary strings where each bit represents the individual state of one of the two qubits. These binary strings are often converted to their decimal representations for conciseness. In general, an n-qubit system will have two of the n distinguishable states. The computational basis vectors for the space that the state vector lives in are typically labeled 0 through 2 to the n minus 1. The inner product for the space is the obvious generalization from the single qubit case. The uniform superposition, denoted S, is a special state that has equal probability of collapsing to any of the classical states upon measurement. We're finally ready to discuss quantum computing, specifically the quantum circuit model of quantum computation. A quantum circuit is a series of quantum gates, each of which usually acts on only one or two qubits at a time, followed by a measurement. The basis state the system collapses to is the result of the computation and ideally tells you something useful. Quantum computing is significantly easier than regular quantum mechanics because the state of the qubits doesn't change unless they're passed through a quantum gate, which changes their state in a simple manner. Whereas in regular quantum mechanics, systems evolve according to the Schrodinger equation. A quantum gate is the physical implementation of a linear transformation. That is, when a qubit passes through a quantum gate, its state vector is transformed into the state vector that would result from applying the linear transformation that the gate implements. Turns out you only need a handful of simple gates to carry out any computation. One of the most ubiquitous is the NOT gate, which acts on a single qubit to turn the state 0 into the state 1 and the state 1 into the state 0. By the way, the linear transformations that quantum gates implement have to be unitary. Among other things, this means they're reversible and preserve inner products, which is good because this means if we pass in a normalized vector, we get one out. Another popular gate is the Hadamard gate, not to be confused with the Hamiltonian. It's useful in creating the uniform superposition. One interesting property of the Hadamard gate is that it's its own inverse, so applying it twice does nothing. The most common two qubit gate is the controlled not gate. It applies a not gate to one of the qubits whenever the control bit is in the state one and does nothing if it's in the state zero. None of the circuits we've looked at so far do anything terribly useful. So we're going to look at one that does. Quantum computations usually begin with the qubits in the state zero, and the first step of most quantum algorithms is to transform the state into the uniform superposition. This is done by applying a Hadamard gate to each of the qubits. 
Actually implementing these programs on real quantum computers is very similar to drawing the sketches we've been drawing. I'll use IBM's quantum experience to illustrate. To create the uniform superposition, we drag and drop a Hadamard gate in front of each of the five qubits, followed by a measurement to confirm that this really did create the uniform superposition. With five qubits, there are 32 basis states, and if we're in the uniform superposition, the probability of collapsing to any given basis state will be 1 over 32, or 0 0.03125. Any single run of this quantum circuit will return the state the system collapsed to upon measurement. So we'll need to run it many times, at least 32, to get a sense of the probabilities of collapsing to the different basis states. I'll run it 5,000 times. Because there's so many different values, I'll have to download the results. They're presented as a count of the number of times each basis state was observed. So to get a probability, we divide this count by 5,000, the number of times we ran the experiment. It seems this did create the uniform superposition. If we were to run this experiment an infinite number of times, we would see these numbers converge to 1 over 32. 